Доброго дня. Good afternoon, dear participants. We continue uh, our geopolitical talks in Ukraine Crisis Media Center. And today we have uh, Vitaly Portnikov. Good afternoon, a famous uh, journalist, political politologist. And it's important for us uh, that in this political review, we uh, cover the topics of uh, geopolitics, of um, external policies, and we have interesting ideas. So therefore, I would like to go to move to our discussion and uh, to start not with a question which we can hear not only in Ukraine, but also abroad on what is going to happen when the Russian war against Ukraine will finish. And is Ukraine ready for compromises, so-called compromises and exchanging the territories uh, to participate NATO? And what is the situation in our in the countries which are allies, uh, the US, the UK, and in general, that are the questions which we would like to cover today. And I think that it would have been correct to start with not from the end, but to try to look further, uh, not to build all, not to understand what kind of scenarios uh, might we see in the future, but to understand where are we now and what does it look like and what kind of historical parallels can we use in this case and what should we do in this case? Speaking of the historical parallels, I mean, the type of mindset and every Everyone tries to find some kind of examples in the history and to use it for today and to make some conclusion. And that is uh, uh, that is why we are talking about Korean scenario, Vietnamese uh, scenario. Now we are talking about Berlin scenario when uh, Germany collapsed and was divided. So how do you see this historical war and the current stage of this uh, historical war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine? And uh, what uh, what does it resemble? You Maybe I will disappoint you, but in fact, um, no parallels with uh, the uh, finals we can not see. Because generally speaking, all of us have seen the collapse and reforming of both uh, land and ocean empires in the 20th century. All of these empires had their own way, had their own history, and these empires have never wanted, strived for collapse. All the time they were trying to to be integral. Winston Churchill said that he is not he doesn't want to lead the funeral procession of uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain. French leaders said uh, French leaders didn't want uh, Algeria to be destroyed and for Algeria to be not the colony of France, but to be independent. Generally speaking, no one ever wanted for the empires to collapse, uh, to disappear, and uh, all the empires, almost all of them, became the national or quasi-national uh, states. Uh, France became a uh, quasi-state, uh, state, uh, Austria became national state, Great Britain became quasi uh, was a state uh, and consists of a few parts. Uh, Spain consists. Uh, Spain is a quasi state, and uh, and I I can imagine that they are still in the process of forming. And the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the Russian Empire collapsed. Uh, as of nineteen uh, twenties, uh, uh, when we if we consider the Russian the Soviet Russia, um, it 
was it has collapsed. And uh, generally speaking, we are saying that Russia is a lost empire and it has to disappear. Russia is not an empire that is a state uh, which are not the competitors uh, with lots of different nations which are not the competitors to the Russians. We have never seen so many people living in in Russian, uh, in the Russian Federation in Russia. But nevertheless, uh, that's been the first time when uh, the Russians uh, have uh, the chance to build uh, their state, maybe together with some small nations which inhabit Russia, because they are small nations, one, two million. But nevertheless, they want to recover their territorial empire in the framework of uh, what they had uh, before 1901. And actually, that's uh, actually the same situation as uh, we could have seen is, for example, the French people wanted to to bet on everything to get Algeria. And in history, we have never seen this situation when the empire which is collapsing was uh, coming back to the previous position. We have never seen the, Rom the Roman Empire was trying to do that. And in fact, it's so destroyed. Byzantine uh, Im Empire, after uh, they wanted to come back uh, to their previous borders, and it's self-destroyed to the sizes of Constantinople. And it's been the first time in the history of the world when the former empire, which already turned into national state, is trying to bring back the previous borders. And they have the new technologies, the nuclear weapon, and they are ready to sacrifice the human resources, economy, demographic perspectives. They are ready to sacrifice everything to get the territories uh, which they controlled uh, around 30 years ago. And what about uh, Germany? Uh, what about uh, the Hitler's revenge and uh, bringing back uh, the heritage they had, which was actually partially occupied, but the territory was border. I'm not sure that it's the correct comparison because the ideology of Germany was the ideology of um, spreading the the space for a living. They did not uh, conceal the fact that they want uh, to have the new territories. The sense of Hitler, Germany is uh, the idea which was uh, named by, which was later repeated by Slobodan Milosevic, uh, because both were saying that uh, they need the new territories. And that is the reason why the neighbors of uh, Germany thought that everything is fine, because they thought that uh, Germany wants to get to Austria, Sudet, and and the territories where Germans uh, used to live, uh, and also Poland, where lots of Germans used to live. And later, it appeared to be that the interest of Germany, the interest in uniting Germans in one state was just an absolute masking of the idea of um, expanding the living uh, spaces to Ural, because uh, Germans did not live uh, around Ural area. Um, yes, okay, I get it. So from the point of view of observer or from the point of view of Russia, of course, in Russia, they say that they are trying to, to repeat um, uh, their achievements after the Second World War, so that uh, the country is uniting against uh, one enemy. And from the point of view of Ukraine, um, considering what you've said, uh, that is a war which is ongoing against a metropolis, so that we would not become the part of colony, because, uh, but there were the times, um, uh, according to some historical documents, uh, around 1930s, Ukrainians, uh, according to this uh, consensus, so we had uh, more people than Russians. Um, you mean like uh, Velikorosy? So when uh, in the Soviet times, uh, during consensus, um, when they were when people were asked. Uh, what is their nationality? They uh, were naming Ukrainian. And um, do you know why that was happening? Because in the Russian Empire, it was considered that uh, uh, Ruski 
Russians is uh, Velikorus and Malorus, and therefore all the cities in 19th, 20th century, they became the cities which uh, were uh, Velikorus, uh, except for two cities on the territory of Ukraine where we had the Russian Empire, uh, mainly Poltava and, uh, namely Poltava and Berdychev, who is a uh, majority of Jews living there, but majority consider themselves uh, all round, uh, they consider it uh, uh, big Russians, and, uh, but uh, during uh, URSR, uh, it was not a shame anymore to become Ukrainians, and it appeared to be that there are more Ukrainians, and uh, you and Russians considered it always as the part of competition, of the national competition. I remember it very vividly. I was on the um, on the meeting of uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, and uh, where uh, when Alexei uh, through he was chosen a patriarch, and uh, he was Estonian German by his origin, and his competitor was Ritiger, and uh, there were two people. Uh, one was uh, Denisenka, that is the future uh, patriarch uh, Filaret, and the second one uh, is uh, the future patriarch Vladimir. And when I was asking the priests uh, who are they going to vote for, and most of them were saying that they are going to vote for Ritiger, and I could not understand uh, the Filaret was very popular in these um, among people, because they were saying that German is better than Ukrainian. So the Russian ethnic code priests uh, collected, uh, gathered together, not to vote for Ukrainian as the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. And these kind of com comprise and this kind of competition was found on each and every level. And now Putin is also resolving uh, the demographic situation. So he wants to resolve the issue of competition between the Russians and Ukrainians. The more Putin will get n maybe not even the territories, uh, uh, the less Ukrainians uh, he will have, uh, the, uh, the better their victory will be. Uh, that is actually a very good point, because uh, very typically we can see that um, uh, Putin was actually mentioning, given that, that um, he was doing that not even once, but a few times so when he was smiling and when he was asked what is the objective of uh, denazification and so on and so forth. So like the fake things uh, they are repeating. And in fact, he was saying, uh, you know, we are not taking uh, the territories. It's not bad. So the fact that their objective is to get the territories is obvious. And the second thing, I totally agree with you, in the Russian Federation, they were doing the calculations. How many uh, human resources do they need inside uh, the Russian Federation to develop uh, um, without um, depending on the external surrounding. And they have uh, come with a number 200 million uh, people in the conditions of the demographic uh, crisis, which we can see not only in the Russian Federation, but also in Europe. It is impossible to achieve alone inside the country. Therefore, capturing uh, the people and uh, like what kidnapping uh, the children and Russificating them. So that is an objective, not only to capture the new territories, but also to capture the people, the population. And it is obvious. And uh, beside that, we can say that uh, the officials in the Russian Federation are repeating these narratives and uh, as the solution to demographic crisis. So the objectives are uh, obvious. Um, recovering the borders of empire and what about the end of the war so i can hear that quite often from many people who have uh, the impact on the decision making making both in ukraine and also we can say that it's also antony blinken and he says that the wars end with negotiations and then and then we make the decision, what kind of negotiations will we have? Like the ones which we had after Vietnam or after Korea. So I have two opinions which uh, we have to understand. Uh, do all the wars finish with uh, negotiations? And the second one, 
The second question is, what is more realistic scenario for the Russian war in Ukraine, uh, taking into account uh, the possibility of uh, bilateral negotiations? Because uh, quite often the Western um, media, they discuss it as quite realistic uh, possibility that Putin and Zelensky are negotiating and agreeing on something. And uh, in my opinion, that's... Um, That's impossible, and now we understand uh, why it is impossible, but also in the future it is impossible. From my point of view, the direct negotiation with Putin will be uh, the collapse of our plan of uh, Ukraine development, because so uh, we will have no sanctions, because uh, uh, the Russian Federation will get additional possibilities, and we will come back to what we have now, and we have lost uh, 10 dozens of thousands of people so the first question do we need negotiations do we really need negotiations and what could be the scenario so not all the wars finished with negotiations some wars uh, finish de facto so there are wars which finish which uh, come to their end because uh, the sides understand that they uh, will not achieve what they wanted and then they conclude peace and this peace can be can last for decades of uh, and um without the real document and uh, uh, and this that is the thing which we can see with the North and South Korea and just recently North Korea said that uh, that is another country with another nation and we can find quite a few examples of uh, this scenario but first of all I suggest uh, to move the chess the figures on the chessboard I do not think that is a problem for uh, the president of Ukraine can talk to the president of the Russian Federation. I think that the Russian Federation president um, has no point of talking to Ukraine's uh, president because the Russian Federation came to the point when uh, they uh, consider Ukraine the state with uh, limited uh, possibilities, uh, using the quoting, um, the uh, citing uh, the representative of um, Korean uh, of North Korea. So it's like something like Portugal's independence because Portugal existed as an independent restored country. It has a quite a big impact. It has some relations with Spain, but nobody considered it um, as a state. And in this case, we have similar situation. I think that the Russian Federation will have no negotiations because of the same reasons, because uh, the middle aged uh, middle age uh, friends uh, could not have uh, negotiations with Burgundy, but uh, who they had negotiations was with Great Britain because uh, uh, they, because um, uh, Burgund, um, uh, Burgund and Normandy uh, officials, so they were the representatives of Great Britain. So who Putin can have negotiations with, with the U.S. Uh, that is uh, subject to negotiations. Ukraine is not the subject to negotiations. Why? Or why we, so that is important, why we are always, let's not, uh, let's not speak about him. I think that I understand everything about him. I had the chance to hear him, uh, to see him lots of times, and I do understand everything about him. And what about us? So we have two options in Ukraine. If we agree, and uh, if we admit that bilateral negotiations is possible, even though it is prohibited by the order of, um, by the decree of the president, um, and actually it makes uh, uh, the Russians very irritated with this fact. And if they will have not a strong position or our position will be strong, they will be ready for these negotiations, for this dialogue. But if we sit at the table, we will have lots of problems, lots of problems. So first of all, that the war will not end in this way, the big war between the Russian Federation of the Russian Federation and Ukraine. But nevertheless, there is another point. If it is not directly, but uh, it is done through some other countries. And this way, we admit that we are not the subject uh, to uh, to these uh, negotiations. Why do we need to Ukraine uh, with Ukraine? That is what uh, the Russian Federation does. Uh, I think that it's a trap uh, because even the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, said that if you will not provide us the weapon, the U.S., we can lose and i will not continue this uh, phrase so we will 
lose. I do not agree with this um, narrative because it makes us, um, it brings us to the station when we do not have, we're not becoming the subject to these negotiations. And during the war, in fact, we are the subject of negations. Um, uh, we have the biggest level of subjectivity in the last 30 years. And having uh, this uh, level, we can achieve some results. We can do that. We can achieve that. So how can we avoid this trap? The situation is difficult for us. Uh, so where the situation will be profitable for us? You see, we cannot agree with one a uh, small topic. Uh, I think that the Russians uh, will not have negotiations with Ukraine, but you think that we, um, they are ready, but we should, uh, they will not agree for that. We have different opinion about this. The time is different. I say that from the point of view uh, of my understanding of them, they, uh, uh, so I have this uh, formula, uh, they are attacking not when they are at most strong, but when their competitor is uh, the weakest. And that is the first uh, thing. Uh, the second thing is that they are talking a lot about the context of the informational, um, informational war. And the war is ongoing. And in this war, they are using all uh, everything they can use, um, as well as we have to do that. So the situation they have is not the best one. We have the difficult situation, but their situation is getting worse. So that is a thing I can say for sure. Not in numbers, but I do not know what is going to happen in two, three years. But uh, so far and in the next half a year, the situation in the Russian Federation will get uh, only worse. And therefore, I think I'm talking about the period when they will understand that our position is strong and in this case I think that they will uh, sit at uh, the table and uh, I'm quite sure about that uh, understanding what they had but uh, they could have crossed the red line after which they understand that uh, uh, their negotiations uh, with the with Ukraine are destroying the regime. Yes, it is also possible. And in this case, uh, they will want, uh, they will wish uh, for negotiations, but not with us. So why they didn't do that? Um, why they were talking about um, after the war in Ishkegi? Because that was another regime. And at that time, there was a competition between the models of development of the Russian Federation. When they agreed uh, with Chechnya, they had the competition of the opinions on what what should we do with these regions, so, which are the, the problem for the Russian Federation? There was an opinion that uh, Chechnya has to be isolated from Russia. Yes, there was this kind of opinion, but this uh, opinion lost because uh, uh, the um, uh, federal uh, vertical uh, became uh, the reigning regime. Uh, so you mentioned Chechnya, and for me, the marker that everything will get only worse when I had, um, when I was on the Russian uh, TV and I wrote an article with a plan of how we can resolve the issue with the Chechnya war, I suggested to have the all Russian um, referendum on the territory of uh, Chechnya on excluding. Uh, it uh, from the Russian Federation for the Russians uh, to vote uh, um, to expel um, Chechnya, and uh, they were ready for that because they didn't need this terror. And uh, for Chechnya to vote whether they want to be the part of the Russian Federation and to have the change, uh, the amend to the constitution um, on uh, expelling uh, the, the part um, from uh, the uh, from the uh, from the territories, uh, yes, it has no. Uh, but in fact, nobody supported me at that time. It's not that someone agreed with these uh, thesis. And in fact, I managed to, to protect uh, by saying that I'm a foreigner. I'm not uh, the citizen of, uh, uh, of the Russian Federation. And uh, I'm a foreign journalist. But I understood if I was Russian, in this case, they would have uh, considered me uh, betraying, betraying uh, the state. And when I saw this, uh, um, this opinion of the Russians, I understood that everything is getting only worse. Uh, yes, it's clear. But nevertheless, you said that um, 
uh, the situation was different, um, but nevertheless, at that time, um, there was understanding that on some of the stage there can be these kind of uh, agreements. And moreover, in 1990s, when uh, when the uh, when Ukraine was not in the best situation, when uh, there was an uh, agreement with uh, Tatarstan, with Saha and uh, Yakutia, and uh, it did not uh, end with fragmentation with of the Russian Soviet Republic. But nevertheless, uh, uh, in some periods, so we cannot expel the situation that there can be this kind of agreement which can transform in the Russian Federation, uh, that we are doing what we want and uh, you uh, as citizens, uh, you get minimum um, products uh, and also being uh, a noble nation, it's transforming. And we can see the situation when the Russians uh, are not managing, the government is not managing uh, the minimum um, protection um, situation. And uh, for example, when there was a terrorist attack, they could no not do anything. And as we have seen the situation with uh, with Ural um, and uh, cities, uh, one by one, they start to protest. Uh, and by the way, you know, uh, the logos you can hear um, that are the normal Russians who actually support the war. They say that uh, when we were agreeing uh, to send uh, additional resources to the Crimea, uh, the water, you found the way. And when we need uh, the water, the governors uh, left, uh, uh, left Orsk. Well, uh, that is uh, the sink which was set uh, in the Russian literature. That is uh, the term which is used to Kaftan. And they, they do not understand that if you are giving the money somewhere, you, are, you have to, to take it from somewhere. Yes, and you do not get more money during the war. The Russian Federation is uh, spending 6% of the GDP. And that is, uh, that is an enormous number. That is not we can, what we can hear in another about 2% uh, uh, for minimum uh, needs. Uh, that is 6% uh, not for the law enforcement. And I think that they even do not consider uh, the National Guard. Uh, that is expenditures for the army. In uh, the Russian Federation has uh, collapsed, of course, when they spent more money, but the, and the reasons uh, were higher. So at that time they were spending 16%. Uh, uh, but in the conditions when you have to cover uh, the holes uh, in such on such a big territory, that is quite a problem. And who knows what will happen next? And I would not expel the scenario when. All these black swans, so maybe they are not that big, but the uh, but uh, these black swans, uh, they um, can get to the right direction, to the right place. But nevertheless, uh, I could not uh, do what I wanted to do, even though we're very close uh, to this. So I could not destroy the idea. So you've mentioned that uh, the historical um, parallels do not work in this case. And uh, uh, to be honest, if we're talking about the situation which we can see in Ukraine, in this case, I would like to say that it's it more resembles me the Finland situation. Finland, which wanted to have the normal development and uh, which did not provoke uh, the Soviet Union got occupations from the Soviet Union just because of the geopolitical interests of the part of Finland. Yes, yes, they made uh, they were resisting a lot. And the first days of that war, uh, the the Finland the the Russian war in Finland, uh, uh, one the ratio of uh, the deaths was one to seventeen, one Finnish uh, soldier to seventeen Soviet ones. And when the Soviet uh, Union understand that they will not get it in this way, they sent more people. And in this case, Finland was ready to negotiate. But there is one aspect about it: Finland had the compromise, uh, agreed, uh, compromised. Uh, uh, well, compromise is not the correct word. So they refused from the part of their territory. It is when you're raped, when you're killed, when you are forced to do something, that's not the compromise. Uh, when you 
they had an option. Uh, they had an option to uh, to disappear as a state because the the Soviet uh, Union already had uh, their puppets in the government. That is uh, what we could have seen in Kyiv uh, in in the old times. Uh, um, but there is another thing to that, to these stories. When Finns were deciding whether they need to fight for these territories or not, Finnish delegation has uh, visited Berlin and they uh, met uh, uh, Hering and uh, Reis Marshall said that Germany has approved the principal decision on attacking the Soviet Union and instead of losing the people, Finland can help Germany in this attack and get back all these territories and even more. And in fact, after the war between Germany and the Soviet Union, the Finnish uh, army got the territories which they gave to the Soviet Union and occupied a huge territory of uh, Soviet Karelia, which had to be to become the part of uh, Finnish Finland. So Finland became defeated uh, but nevertheless another thing uh, both uh, great britain and the us uh, in 1961 uh, they greeted finland um, with for getting back uh, congratulating uh, finland for getting back the territories even though they supported the soviet union uh, to be honest uh, that is a separate uh, topic i was also interested in this topic and that time norway and sweden were suggesting their support to finland a strong support and finland didn't have uh, the same opportunities uh, possibilities as sweden had but the general understanding on how uh, to not to have uh, the burst um, of the Second World War in Europe, it brought us uh, to the illogical uh, historical actions. When the country which is protecting its uh, integrity then uh, asks uh, the fascist uh, Germany, which was not uh, the um, maybe the enemy, but uh, it was definitely not the country which uh, you could have build uh, the common development, which you could have um, common values. So at that time, Finland didn't have these kind of issues. Many countries uh, in Western Europe, they had uh, good relations with Germany, Sweden, Norway, but nobody expected Hitler to go so far in his ambitions of occupation the neighborhood countries. But what do we have in the end? We have the situation when after using the situation and actually Finns were saying that they had no other option they had to ask uh, Germany in this uh, way to support it uh, but uh, it worked out and in fact uh, they uh, uh, were defeated in the end uh, because uh, they had uh, their territories lost and uh, also the uh, got the government uh, from Moscovia after the Second World War and after the decades uh, that was uh, something that was uh, um, holding the Soviet Union when they were I would say that is uh, limited um, so so the colony with the opportunities because uh, uh, Moscow was given a few candidates and uh, Moscow was uh, choosing who can be the prime minister of Finland yes uh, it was not that difficult failed the my share mother game is described in this way and I am um, I'm saying what is written by him so um, at some time of uh, uh, in some cases, they were using these kind of uh, relations uh, to to set uh, the the government. Uh, I cannot agree that Finland became uh, defeated. Uh, on the other hand, we had uh, those who won, who were fighting for being independent. Poland, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, and where they were that time when they were comparing themselves to Finland. So in fact, Finland, which had their army on the Eastern Front, they were able to agree with the Allies and with the Great Britain and with the Soviet Union and the US so that they will not uh, uh, attack their integrity. And uh, at the same time, they will pull back their um, soldiers from uh, 
uh, Leningrad, and uh, we are talking about the situation which already occurred in the history. And we, and in this case, we have to talk about the situation when Ukraine understands that we cannot bring back our territories. Who will tell us, don't worry, you will get your territories back at some certain point of time? We do not have these conditions. Yes, we do not have this kind of uh, vision for the future that it will be possible. Even worse, or those who could have done that potentially obviously are not willing to do that even now uh, to do the strategic steps um, to to make it happen. So I guess in this case, it's interesting that the country which. Uh, agreed to, to give away the part of their territories and the base uh, um, bases uh, but in fact they lost the generation of people who could have lived uh, as uh, french people lived who were also in a very difficult situation in the beginning of the war but they were on the right uh, side of the history charles de gaulle and uh, most of the resistance movement in fact they found their place of this um, victory team. It's a very difficult uh, historical question, and for me, a very interesting conclusion. If you give away a part of territories, and you kind of understand that it's uh, the end, uh, you are pulling back uh, 500,000 of people from the occupied territories, not everyone in Ukraine understand uh, what was happening because so that everything was destroyed, everything was uh, brought away and what was uh, not uh, brought uh, away from these territories was destroyed. People were saying goodbye to their lands uh, and uh, then after one year it appears uh, to be that these kind of things uh, do not uh, let you live uh, peacefully because the war is moving to another level where you have even more problems and more opportunities even though it sounds strange and therefore even the even though the parallels are quite uh, strange i would conclude uh, that uh, we should not use uh, the previous historical experience to compare with what we have now i I agree with you that it's a unique situation from the point of view of historical development because Lots of things, uh, lots of factors were not there through all the history. So the empires were collapsing, the metropolis existed, even though we have uh, the example of Great Britain and uh, France. But nevertheless, there are lots of other factors which cannot be... Uh, which we can, haven't seen uh, before. And when we are saying that uh, when someone is mentioning Korean scenario, I would not like to use this parallel because it does not suit uh, to this situation. And never, that is for, therefore, I would like to say that there is no strong parallel, even though most of politicians, uh, experts, even the artificial intelligence, which we have in our computers, uh, artificial intelligence, works with facts, um, with previous facts. And in this case, we do not have uh, the um, the entire package of these facts. If, and uh, in this case, even the strongest uh, computer, which was calculating how much time do you need to conquer uh, Kyiv, um, everyone made a mistake, uh, not because it was impossible to conquer Kyiv. Uh, now we know that that was one of the options we had, but... Um, Nevertheless, not all the factors were taken in account, and mainly the things which were no, never taken in account is that the things so, which cannot be calculated to, by numbers, um, there are some things which you cannot calculate. Uh, for example, the readiness to protect your home. When we're talking about the Korean scenario, it's also important uh, to say, but uh, in this case, it is important to mention that it's uh, the, uh, the peace between two sovereign countries. And uh, in this case, we are talking about uh, uh, the peace between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, uh, when we have some territories which both countries consider to be theirs. And if we were talking about uh, Korean scenario, that would have meant uh, 
that uh, the Soviet Union would have uh, made uh, the North Korea the part of the Soviet Union, and South Korea would have considered North Korea the part of South Korea, and that would have meant another scenario. We have uh, Tuva uh, Republic in the Russian Federation. It used to be the part of uh, Chinese People's Republic. By the way, uh, the language they use is not Russian. Yes, it is. Uh, Tuvinian language and Urenkaiski Krai used to be the part of China and all on all of the maps uh, uh, till 1940s it was uh, the the part of China and because uh, no one considered Tuva as well as uh, Mongolia independent and nevertheless nobody took this part of the Soviet Union because to get it you had to fight not Tuva but with the Soviet Union and at that time this Korean uh, scenario matches more the situation in Georgia, in Sagratvelo. Uh, so from the point of view uh, there are the independent kind of independent territories and uh, uh, the Belize and Suhumi might have negotiations uh, in the future in the ideal world. Well, considering the um, geopolitical um, vision, they will make Abkhazia the part of the Russian Federation. Yes, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, moreover, uh, you have heard the statements uh, on Kazakhstan and they are published by pro-government um, officials, uh, so former generals who were forming the narratives about uh, Ukraine before the full-scale war. Nowadays, the same people are trying to warn Kazakhstan and people of Kazakhstan that you should not be uh, so resisting and uh, it's uh, important not to in this case uh, Moscow is threatening Kazakhstan when they start uh, uh, supporting sanctions uh, so so far we understand that uh, there is no potential peace uh, due to the fact uh, that uh, the Putin and the Russian Federation are not ready for that, and they will not be ready for it in the lo in the next half a year because their appetites are rising and the taste of blood affect this kind of predator. And from the point of view of Ukraine, there are no proper conditions. So everyone is preparing their stronger conditions. If it's not negotiations, uh, then it can be the future balance which can lead to some certain decision. So the next thing, uh, the thing which we already discussed um, and uh, lots of narratives which are formed nowadays, um, it seems to me, and actually I would like to ask you about your opinion about it, it seems that Ukraine is quite successful in insisting on truth uh, in about Russian war in Ukraine, about the objectives and the situation in 2022. At least uh, it was obvious not only on the in, in the international media and TV channels and also in international platforms, and uh, in this way, we managed to report officially that in the rate, uh, there is a rate uh, of soft uh, fort, soft power, global index uh, of uh, soft power, that we have, where we went up, uh, not only from the point of view of recognition, but also uh, in the framework of uh, the focus uh, and we went up in many um, aspects uh, and uh, for example that was the president maybe some politicians were irritated with the direct uh, messages of the president of ukraine to their governments uh, to their nations um, and people were um, evaluating very highly the motivation of Ukrainian nation and strength, and it was working out. And the Russian Federation's rates went down, so it was a reputational bottom. They, at, they reached their reputational bottom, so they got 103rd place. Um, and uh, that was uh, the uh, survey which was conducted all around Ukraine. 183 countries were surveyed 
in this way, uh, both China um, uh, and also um, African countries. And what is happening nowadays? I have. I think we have to be honest about it. The Russian Federation Federation is going up in these rates, and Ukraine is going down, and therefore we are almost on the same level. Meaning that the latest uh, statements on forming of pro-Russian narratives in the U.S. Congress and the head of um, the Development Department admitted, and even the groups, pro-Putin's groups, diluting uh, the position that the Russian Federation is a violator of all the international laws and rules. And now everyone is uh, evaluating uh, it as the war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. And we can hear it even more, not only in the global South countries. I do not like this uh, term. Um, by the way, it was used for another situation. Uh, so I can suggest uh, our government uh, not to insist on the um, global South countries, um, but to um, but to understand that each country uh, values its uh, integrity and independence. So our situation, our rates go down and the Russian rates go up, and we can see that the Russian Federation is attacking everything they do themselves. So, uh, that can be terrorist attacks, uh, for example, um, capturing um, the the Polishka nuclear power plant, and uh, they nowadays say that uh, it's the, their uh, property. They do the same thing with a terroristic attack inside Russia, blaming Ukraine and making Ukraine a terroristic state, a terrorist state. So I'm sorry, but. It seems like uh, obvious for us how, how they use uh, Gabel's lies and how they use his principles nowadays, but the world does not understand that, and in fact, the world. So the question I have is, what should we do is a very long discussion, but what about the question, do you feel that there is some critical point where we can lose our advantage, uh, the reputational advantage because of what the Russian Federation does. So, to be honest, it does not surprise me because I expected it to happen in 2022 and back in 2022 I was trying to explain that because I had the experience of Balkan Wars war and I remember that there was a period um, of uh, Balkan War, uh, there was attack of uh, Sarajevo and Dubrovnik, uh, killing uh, civilians by uh, Serbians or para-Serbian military groups, um, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, Croatia, and how it was um, accepted in the West. And, and uh, how uh, the head of the presidents of uh, uh, Alia Azadbekovic and the president of uh, uh, Croatia seemed uh, the, um, the heroes um, in the eyes of the Western. So uh, to be honest, uh, so I can see some similarities with what we can see in Ukraine and in Croatia. We can consider uh, the situation in Croatia and we can see similar situation. Maybe Admiral Tushbo was more experienced politician, but that's a bit um, another aspect. But with the time passing, I saw how everything started to fade, how they started to mention that uh, Alia Azadbehovic is in fact ethnic nationalist. And we have to talk about his position, about the position of uh, Bosnia Muslims. And uh, Franja Tchpovna, uh, he's a authoritarian in Croatia. We do not have the real democracy. Of course, Serbs, uh, uh, Serbians are trying to uh, violate uh, the territorial integrity of the neighbors. And Slobodan Milosevic is dictator. And what does it, did it lead it? When in date, and on the military base in the U.S. where the decision on the peace on Bosnia was made next to Aliyah Azadbekovic, uh, Sobodan Milosevic was sitting. 
And I'm not even talking about the leaders of Bosnian uh, Serbs. Uh, and that was a point when Serbia beca became um, the state. And if there was no mistake of Sobodan Milosevic with Kosovo, this uh, state uh, would have uh, improved its effect. Uh, and uh, even though their government uh, created this war. So we have to understand that the war which was attacked uh, has attention and popularity, uh, first of all, uh, for a very short time. And second of all, you need shock for that, uh, shock uh, like uh, killing civilians. OK, so OK, it's not uh, OK, but nevertheless, um, in Croatia, the main phrase uh, phrases uh, were about those period, about uh, Franz Tuzman's uh, period. So another important thing is that uh, shock is is what um, attracts uh, and uh, demands uh, the next steps uh, to uh, out of this shock because people want to resolve it, uh, the situation, uh, for it not to happen again, uh, and then they stabilize. And what about uh, the um, the next shock? And we can see that uh, the Russian Federation is coming back to to uh, to their ideas of 2022 and their attacks, which we can see nowadays, uh, that are the attacks uh, in the east and south of Ukraine, mainly namely Kharkiv, Odessa, and um, that are high priority um, cities, so they are close to the front line. Uh, so that is Kherson, Zaporizhia, and we can see the same action, the same murders, the same destruction of uh, civilian houses. And they are not going to explain that we have some mistakes, which they did before, or that that is um, anti-aircraft uh, missiles. Uh, uh, so there is a new wave of um, big uh, victims. Uh, and the shock reaction is not there anymore, or maybe we are not showing that enough. No, shock looks a bit different. Shock uh, is what we've seen in Bucha or in Rpin. It We need uh, the enemy to enter your territory, create uh, not by avia bombs, but by the solid actions against civilians. Uh, and uh, murderers, as we have seen in Srebrenica or Bucha, and then you come back to these territories and you demonstrate it. Just imagine, Srebrenica was controlled by Bosnian Serbs. Would we have ever known about this situation? Yes, it's true, and I think that that's one of additional factors. Why the Russians are going to fight for Mariupol? Because the evidences of the horrible genocide uh, murders are there. So I think that Mariupol is dozens of times more shocking than Bucha is. But when you found out about Srebrenica, for West, it was the sign for West that they have to stop this war. If this war leads to these kind of things, then we have to force all the parties to this uh, conflict to stop fighting because that can lead to to dozens of Serebrenica. And in this case, we need to ask ourselves the question, can we, can West make the Russian Federation stop? Yes, because that should have been the reaction to Bucha situation. It should have been the point where when West have should have said that you have to stop, you have to sit at the table and you have to negotiate because your war is massive death is of civilians, but that didn't take place. Well, I think that the West can do that, but we cannot see that due to different reasons, uh, and uh, the economy is uh, 30, 40 times bigger. And I think that uh, the Chinese uh, f aspect is uh, there, and it's very strong. Without uh, agreements with Xi Jinping and with this agreement that are two different people, even um, physically you can have seen that. It's obvious that, unfortunately, China, in my opinion, is not playing the role it could have 
played. And from the point of China, what do they do? And from the point of uh, the Russian Federation, it does. So there is no balance here in place. And I think that um, the US and many people in the White House are looking at this. Uh, they are looking more at China than Ukraine. But to be honest, uh, the US uh, is uh, reacting, responding really strongly on uh, Beijing desire to support the Russian Federation. So it seems to me like the, there are lots of things which the US is not ready for. Uh, they are in the context of uh, Chinese respond. And uh, sometimes we are just considering only the public manifestations, but what is happening behind the curtains? And uh, in this case, uh, we have to think whether it will happen so that the final of the war, which will be decided not by the West or Ukraine, but by China. Anyways, so we can see that uh, there are big efforts uh, to involve China. So uh, in uh, Xi Jinping was uh, meeting Lavrov. No, I will clarify it. I know all of us understand the role of China. And uh, we do understand that the U.S. has its own leverages on China. Export of 80 billion from um, from China to U.S. Uh, had taken into account not the best condition of the economy development is um, in China is a big leverage. Uh, some politicians state uh, that if I if I will become the president, we will resolve this issue in three days. Yeah, but it's not Chinese politician. Yes, but nevertheless, the understanding of the world is that the key or the code, for example, uh, the code uh, from the lock of the way to the magical solution, uh, the, the code is somewhere in Moscow. So most of the people think so that it depends on Putin's positions. Uh, uh, so sadly, they are not uh, mentioning Kyiv because uh, I think that Kyiv and uh, Kyiv government is uh, the subject to this uh, conflict. But no one has mentioned Beijing. Uh, would it happen so that the only code uh, will stay only in Beijing? No, I don't think so. I think that there is an obvious thing which we have to remember. For the US, uh, at least for those politicians who are saying that it's possible to resolve this conflict in two days, so that is a territorial conflict. And therefore they say that if we sacrifice territories, you can keep integrity, uh, state and uh, population and so on and so forth. I would say that uh, between uh, Joseph Biden and Donald Trump, there is a difference maybe in in that, that uh, for Joseph Biden, it is important for, to have a strong position on these kind of negotiations, as we can see here from 2022. You have to liberate more territories uh, to have strong position uh, for negotiations. And for Donald Trump, uh, it doesn't matter uh, what kind of position will we have, because he thinks that he will negotiate everything himself. And, and for Xi Jinping, it's uh, a bit different. He is more realistic about this situation, and he says that it's not the territory issue, but about the concern of the Russian Federation. So the war is for the geopolitical interest of the Russian war. The West has to listen to to hear the geopolitical interests of the Russian Federation. But we do understand that geopolitical interest of the Russian Federation is not Crimea and, Don, and not Donbass, but the territories of the Russian Empire. And Xi Jinping understand that, and he understands Another important thing that the more territories, so uh, the more republics will become the uh, next uh, territories, uh, the more uh, possibilities China will have on these territories. If uh, these territories are the part of the West, in this case, these territories uh, play according to Western rules. And if they are becoming the part of the Russian world, uh, the uh, Russian territories they are using Russian rules. And for China, it is important for the Russian Federation not to lose. But also, it is also important for them, for the Russian Federation not to become very strong, because uh, if they will destroy, if the Russian Federation will destroy Ukraine, they will bring back the 
their positions in Europe and China doesn't want that. China is interested in bipolar world, the world where the Russian Federation will be under China and where there will be no um, strengths in uh, Russia. Yes, it's uh, obvious and we've publicly heard it about uh, the uh, uh, about the offer to divide it uh, to divide the world in two parts uh, the way how people live in during the cold war but i think that washington is not very glad about this uh, offer and uh, this kind of uh, agreement to divide the world in two is not there because uh, take also because it's even more complicated now when we have so many nuclear states and by the way there is another thing which i would like to mention In Ukraine, we are always uh, surprised uh, that there is no understanding uh, that uh, Putin can be stopped only by power, by force. Um, from our point of view, because uh, we are facing uh, these attacks and um, we understand uh, how weak the decisions of the world, um, of the West and of the uh, US are, and I have the question how we can proceed, um, what arguments can we use to proceed the world that their hope for Ukraine, which will stop uh, the, uh, the Russian Federation, that for them that is the possibility to prepare for provocations, uh, for conflicts, and to prepare their stronger position. Why they don't see what I consider to be obvious, that in midterm, even if we consider the historical uh, parallels and um, we know who live there, they can make uh, it a police uh, dictatorship. They can concentrate uh, all the efforts um, uh, in the, I mean, the Russian Federation. They can make uh, this military machine. And in the nearest future, there is a window of opportunity to stop them in Ukraine. Why this window of opportunities, which I am uh, which I can see that it will be in, still open in the next uh, month uh, um, and even year when you can concentrate less efforts and to achieve something. Why it is being postponed in a long box uh, where these resources uh, and human resources, financial resources and other international resources will be growing. So how can we, what kind of arguments we can use uh, to pursue it? So I think it's happening because the West uh, considers uh, security issues and they are um, considering two options which uh, can be not serious from the point of view of collective West. So the best scenario is that Ukraine is winning in Western um, understanding of these um, and if they are not bringing back their territory they are winning uh, the opportunity to resolve um, their future ukraine become the part of member and not uh, and the war is over there is the worst scenario the russian federation is winning ukraine disappears as a state or as a independent state and becomes uh, the part of the uh, federation and uh, uh, we had these kind of um, russia till 1991 one and it actually expanded the russian federation is not going to fight nato the russian federation is not going to find uh, the nuclear uh, state it will stop somewhere in Ujurat and we will decide how to stabilize it uh, did you uh, is your um the best scenario for ukrainians was that um to give away the part of the territories uh, so i would not uh, avoid the I, w I would not speak of the scenario where we bring the back the territory so i'm talking about the western point of view how a westerners understand this situation so uh, that ukraine uh, there is no option for ukraine in the western opinion that ukraine will bring back all their territories why they are not considering these kind of situation if we have um, zelensky peace formula and we understand that uh, I'm always asking the question, so when we are giving away the territories, how will you secure this line? How you can 
support this line and in the end everyone uh, agrees with me that it's impossible because the borders are the natural barrier yes of course but it's uh, in the past because the international law is violated and we have what we have but what we do agree with that why uh, we ask the questions uh, in uh, social uh, sociology how ukrainians are Ukrainians are ready to give up uh, the territories? Why do we have this kind of track? If we understand, and uh, we as politicians understand that that will not stop the war, that that will not bring us to the um, decision, and this track is developed not by the people, it's actually very difficult to understand uh, who understand how it works, but uh, for uh, uh, but it's uh, this narrative is promoted by the other people i want to psychologically understand this situation how we can understand these psychological waves i do not want us to analyze uh, the thing which we do not have expertise in but um, considering the situation in the middle east uh, so we are going to we are discussing how we should negotiate with uh, the west so why the west understands it in this way but having this scenario in hand uh, we, with our official scenario the occupation of the territories including uh, the autonomous republic of crimea well west does not uh, see it in this way first is positive one when ukraine is still on the map and the negative one when ukraine is not on the political world we are not talking about ukrainian integrity we are talking about about the Ukraine and its existence in the future. Well, I want us to consider the third option as well, and to not only to consider what the West thinks, what do we need to do for the West not to think in this way? I think that both scenarios are not realistic. Why do I not consider these two scenarios? Because it doesn't matter. Why? Because if we accepted these two scenarios as positive ones for the West. In this case, we have uh, no reason to talk to the West. Uh, the West is not under the threat, and it doesn't matter whether Ukraine exists or not. So we will have uh, the Russian Federation, which has expanded and has more marginal um, areas. Uh, and I think that if the Russian Federation will win, uh, it will bring lead us to not the territorial but political changes because uh, in this case we can see how effective the russians are and the west shows that they are not effective and they were not able to protect ukraine the russian army is in Uzhran, the famous army which was in Uzhran and um, which uh, uh, attacked um, Hungary and uh, Slovakia, so um, the Russian Federation becomes closer to Europe. It seems to us that it's close, but it's not that close as it can be when the Russian Federation owns Ukraine and uh, the Republic of Belarus, and it becomes one organism and also um, I think that we have to analyze the political changes after this situation. And I'm sure that it will lead to the pure marginalization of the powers, which we can see, to substitution of the political elites. And beside that, we will have a huge migrational crisis because 12, 15 million, and according to German uh, valuation, they will, we will have 10 million of Ukrainians who will leave uh, Ukraine, and that will not be easy for Ukraine, uh, for uh, for Europe, at least for Poland and uh, for other countries. And the political forces, uh, the political powers, um, which will become uh, in the government uh, are already there. For example, in Germany, that is Marie Le Pen's. Uh, uh, in Germany, we have it uh, Sal Salmini in Italy, Le Marie Le Pen in France, uh, and also um, the, uh, it is Confederation in Poland. Uh, there is a political party in Romania, in Hungary, in uh, Slovakia. In it's already happening in these two countries. Uh, in Czech Republic, we knew that there are these kind of uh, powers and in most of the European countries we have the platforms we, s we see the platforms which say that which can say that you see the Russian Federation is nearby and we have to understand that it's our neighbor and we have to to compromise and by the way you were mentioning the Middle East the changes in uh, political life uh, uh, in Israel happened after a Syrian war when the Russian Federation started to control the Syrian sky and after that we started to hear what do we want from us uh, the russian federation is our neighbor and we have to take it in account and before that 
In Israel, nobody was interested in Russian position in Syria. It was there and who cares? And these changes changed everything even until now. Even nowadays, when the Russian Federation is showing how it is supporting Hamas, when the diplomats are insulting Israel, the Israel government is trying to keep their mouth shut. Uh, they are not reacting, they are not responding, because they can see the, the Russian aviation in next to their borders. And that will be the future of Europe. If you ask me what will happen to Europe in case if Ukraine will lose, it will happen as you the situation will be as you can see it in Israel, but even worse, uh, until Pyrenees Peninsula, and that can lead to, to collapse of Europe because all of these people will become Euroskeptics, and that is a domino game. On the one point, um, the domino will be falling um, on the east, uh, um, and uh, from the other point, uh, and on the other stage, it will domino will be falling in the west, and that is a thing we have to discuss with what because when we are talking about the borders of Ukraine, that is a thing uh, we have to talk about uh, from the point of law of uh, from the point of view of uh, international law. But it's like theoretical discussion, and for West, it seems like it's internal topic for Ukraine for the most important thing for you to protect your state. And I think that uh, that is a thing I'm telling to my Polish friends. The question is not how your farmers will get. But the question is that if you, we will have no money, we will not have money to protect, uh, to fit our army, and the Russian Federation will leave uh, Yaroslav Kaczynski and uh, uh, Donald Tusk um, political party will disappear, and confederation will be reigning in your country. And those who consider themselves to be the leaders of Poland, they will be marginals, and only in the history books they will appear. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, share your opinion. The only thing I would like to say, um, from what I've seen, those previous forecasts, we have seen that in Europe, this uh, group of political parties will um, start reigning. Uh, they, uh, did n they were not so dynamic. And uh, in fact, we started to hear conservative voices of preparing um, to prepare for the war with uh, the Russian Federation, because we are stopping the Russian Federation. Uh, the paradox is that when they were um, afraid of another narrative, which in my opinion is um, nowadays used without no reason, when Ukraine will lose or if Ukraine will give up, In this case, we will have to to face. That was a thing they were afraid of. And the conservatives, like, so to say, conservative, uh, they started to dedicate more GDP to army. I would say even militarist one, as uh, Moscow would say. Yes, uh, the Kremlin would have said that. Uh, but in fact, it's militaristic. Because unfortunately, military forces are just uh, the... They, they do not have this military connotation. They uh, have more power and they resolve more than so-called negotiations. So the law of jungle is dominating in these conditions. The UN is and the Security Council show that they are... Mm, they are not able to resolve this issue and everything is um, is confused. Uh, so the conclusion, uh, well, in fact, uh, we have to enhance uh, the positions, uh, even though it is difficult, because when we enhance the position in this uh, situation uh, that is not just military, but it's also institutional resistance, uh, that is the motivation and the integrity, and that are all the words we can hear all the time. But nevertheless, I don't agree with you, and it seems to me that quite often in Ukraine we can hear the repetition of narratives of international media. International media narratives, which uh, international media which do not make conclusions. There are some leakages of information, and um, they are evaluating whether it is realistic or not. And I'm not just uh, maybe I'm not surprised, but our voice in this case uh, is repeating these narratives, even though we understand that you say that the scenario is very hypothetical, theoretical. 
how Ukrainians can imagine this scenario. That is the first thing. Ukrainian cannot imagine this scenario when occupier is occupying his house, raping his wife and killing his children. But it happened in 2022 and we and more of our Ukrainians understand that you cannot allow it happen and therefore the resistance will not decrease and the surveys show that even despite the difficult situations in February the dynamics in three years even despite these uh, difficult conditions 73 76 percent I do not remember the accurate number of Ukrainians are ready to keep on going with the war and our narrative is not the thing we are making the others to repeat and we have to do that because it's truth and if we will start to talk about um about the war we using the words of our partners we will lose and the second thing is that history has shown for many times that their partners can be wrong our truths might be even more realistic when implementing so for example our position the people who understood why land lease uh, why refusing land lease because not only americans did it um, we also agreed uh, not to use the tools and now we're coming back to this question that was a mistake that was an obvious mistake uh, so for the congress uh, we should have uh, considered this kind of option and the third conclusion and the most important one we become the country which was not maybe defeated at this point, but it's only its way into being defeated. If we be honest with ourselves and we consider all the changes happening in the world, and when I'm talking to our partners, they are saying that on this stage you are right, uh, that there is uh, um, fatigue and there are some other things. Uh, they're asking us to show the the results. So of course we have to uh, to to be strong and face uh, the Russian attack. But we can see the achievements inside the country. We can show the achievements in those issues where we can see achievements. So if the Russian Federation is saying that we are corrupted government and we are weak, we can show that on the country we are different. So we are so different from the Russian Federation. And now the question of anti-corruption and um, of honesty are evaluated uh, very highly and we are doing our best in this direction. Uh, it is said that um, that uh, we have weak positions from the point of view of, um, of elections because uh, elections are not possible. It seems to me that nobody is looking for the answers. I'm not saying whether it's correct or not, but inside the country, no one is looking for the realistic answer. Everyone is looking for the answers for today's question. And that is a real problem for us because the attacks on the cities and energy sector is the most important thing. How to protect the lives, how to survive in this war, but nevertheless, what we can do not what we can do actually but what is your opinion how important is the question of uh, not of what we what does this, this loop word look like but how important is to understand uh, what will Ukraine become after this war? We can imagine different scenarios but for me it's obvious that Ukraine will remain sovereign and integral country and uh, its historical achievements uh, its historical goals so will be achieved uh, uh, better i mean like the long term so i mean why we don't see the emphasis so uh, on the achievements inside the country as well i think that people are surviving and that's the reason and that becomes the main issue because with every day of this war the social situation is um, getting worse the security situation is getting worse and people are live with one day and political elites live with uh, um with a weird understanding of electoral uh, interests uh, with the rates and uh, by the way we are 
uh, come into the strong structural crisis. If we will have the parliament which we will not be able to make the decision, we are coming to this point, it can become a problem for uh, the state functioning. And therefore, uh, speaking of the Ukraine of the future after the war um, is important for to, to answer this. We have to understand when will the end of the war will happen and what can territories we will control and who will live in this country. And speaking of the tendencies of 2019, I do not think that we will get democratic state. Uh, most likely we will have a Thrissorian state and uh, maybe not with the current government, maybe we will have changes, but nevertheless, uh, most likely we will have one political force, uh, one political power and one leader who will not um, consider the opinion of uh, social of society and uh, opposition. And this uh, period might take long uh, and it depends on who will leave, uh, who will inhabit Ukraine and what will be the political needs of these people. And if the territories will change, that will happen uh, thanks to the partners. Uh, if uh, the changes will happen uh, in the corruption situation, if um, the changes will happen, we, will, we might have different conditions. But at the moment, so far, there is no demand from the society for this. And therefore, in the post-war period Ukraine, I do not think that post-war period in Ukraine will be easy. The only thing we can avoid is some internal conflict. And I hope that people will not um, have the conflict of identity and we almost overcame this conflict and this conflict will not become the topic to some severe conflict between those people who wanted more ukrainian speaking society and uh, for those who who would say that it doesn't matter what language do we use if we survived and these kind of situations are possible and one of the things uh, which can affect this it uh, like it depends on when it will happen uh, in 2020s or 2030s, what kind of uh, borders we will have, the guarantees for security. If Ukraine will become the uh, member of NATO, and I'm not even talking about the European Union, we will have an investment here and people will return to Ukraine and we and we will have investments, uh, the society will be developing and we will have the demand on for different political powers. And just imagine that there are no so uh, these guarantees, protection, safety guarantees here. Well, I'm not considering this kind of situation because I'm trying not to be an observer of what what can happen in the future. I'm honestly saying that I'm analyzing the situation from the point of view of mitigating uh, the threats uh, and achieving more. If, of course, if we consider different scenario, I can agree with you. But as Ukrainian, uh, I have to say that we want uh, the best future for our state. Uh, the best uh, future is uh, uh, if we get uh, the invitation to not uh, on the Washington summit. But can we achieve that? Well, that is a question that uh, well, it depends. So far, I think it depends less on Ukrainians, even though this question is is uh, the thing we have to promote. But um, uh, well, actually, uh, the chances to be invited uh, are small, but they are still there, and they are not only in the context of the decision of the White House, uh, but also from the point of view of the presidential campaign. Whether it will be used as uh, the um, leverage to enhance uh, the positions of Joseph Biden, uh, because uh, the main, um, because we in this case, we are talking about the weak uh, position. And if it will happen, if it will take place, uh, I don't, um, the, the US can change their decision in the very last moment. But uh, whether we will be able to prepare everything for a summit very fast and the positions of the other states and whether the US will react, uh, respond very fast, uh, very rapidly to this situation. But nevertheless, uh, so far, we do not have any other model. And if we are speaking about this scenario, which are unacceptable for the West, then the country which uh, will have the phantom pins um, and which will lose uh, some territories. And the next uh, um, statement will be to rec 
recover their nuclear uh, strength. And the next one who will become um, governing the country, uh, well, the West does not understand what it uh, what this uh, compromise uh, will uh, lead to. That will lead to um, Ukrainians uh, willing uh, to change uh, the attitude um, their attitude to the West and to NATO. And therefore, I do not want even to consider this kind of scenario. But um, if you're an observ observer, you can consider all scenarios. But we have to avoid this kind of scenario. That is a scenario which will not be liked by the other part of the world. But the Ukrainians will be different from, from now. And as for whether we will get this uh, protection umbrella, well, I think that the situation will not unfold in the other way. But it depends on strength and weaknesses of the Russian Federation and uh, the solid uh, steps of the West. The only thing I understand, um, obviously, is that uh, so far we do not have a um, realistic alternative. And therefore, the discussion on uh, on neutral status, on compromises, um, it will be um, and resultative, and therefore uh, we are not in just uh, we are in a very unique situation because, uh, well, our situation can be very good or very bad. We have a single objective, even though many people say that it's not correct an external policy to narrow down to one channel policy, but nevertheless, we have this kind of situation. So uh, NATO and European uh, Union is uh, the objective which uh, no one can refuse um, in Ukraine from. And the only thing I'm asking it about it is just uh, to finish this internal topic. During the war, during the wars, from my point of view, that is the worst the war is a period when we can have the rapid changes, so very um, strong changes. So shouldn't we postpone this narrative, let's win, and uh, then we can um, resolve all these issues? Should we change uh, something rapidly in internal policies? Not from the point of view of uh, personalities, but from the point of view of the attitude to corruption and uh, so even during uh, not during uh, this situation when we have not the perfect uh, court system through through more attention to to the obvious things. For example, we can see that obviously some of the TV channels have access, uh, some of the TV channels do not have access to digital broadcasting, and it's made on purpose. Yes, it's made on purpose. It's made on purpose uh, from the point of view of the government. So not the, gov not the state, but the government, right? So should we... Uh, carry on with this, uh, because from the one point of view, we, we are told that it's better for us, but nobody has explained why it is better for us. So what is uh, the um, what, is, what is the situation in this uh, case uh, with the trust to the government, the constant uh, the constant uh, tolerance, uh, not only the external war, but also the uh, the um, internal problems? Do we have the window uh, for the changes even in this uh, situation? Well, no one is tolerating this situation. The government cannot be reacting, responding to uh, the, uh, the, the, the words uh, uh, of the society, even if it uh, weakens uh, the position of the state, of the government. Uh, we've heard uh, that from the president. When we, um, when the society was blaming the president, he is just, uh, uh, he's just very, sh he's completely sure that he is right. And, the police, the the culture of uh, communication since 2014. That is the one personality reigning, and when we are talking about the parliamentary collapse, and when we are talking about um, 
the situation that these kind of situation are becoming obvious for our partners. Of course, the cooperation of uh, the president with the leaders of different political powers, meeting with uh, the leaders of political fractions and agreements uh, with the political fractions on the laws. If the uh, presidential fraction does not have the majority or even uh, the needed uh, majority for uh, to approve the laws, it's uh, like uh, needed. But I think that in this case, uh, in Ukraine, they are ready to sacrifice parliament than to recover its function. Consider the sociology. The president has a huge trust, and you know, and it's great. So it's of course uh, decreasing, but nevertheless, uh, the trust is very big, and the parliament has no trust. And the deputies of the parliament, uh, uh, so a mono majority. Uh, got uh, with uh, got the year with uh, the personal um, guarantees of the president. How it ha how it could happen? So they uh, were not uh, they didn't go to um, to work during the war. The um, uh, the agreements uh, were different. So I'm talking about how the society perceives uh, it. Uh, the society does not uh, see the personal um, responsibility of the president uh, because uh, these members of the parliament are there because of the president. So maybe the personal responsibilities of the society have to be revised. Uh, they have to uh, the civil society was not able to manage their own obligations, so they were able to resist uh, the enemy, and we will have to undergo lots of exams on the resilience, uh, and uh, in this case we are talking mo about mobilization. We have to sacrifice lives uh, because we were not able to respond correctly. You have to respond um, with uh, your life, with your health, and with, with your wealth, uh, uh, but uh, the fee is very high, it's at most high, but we have to make our own conclusions. In the future, if Ukrainians want to survive, they have not to do these fatal mistakes, uh, which can lead to them to die or to their relatives to die or to migration. So that is a very high price. They have very high price, which is obvious and example for the entire world. How? neglecting your obligations can lead the entire country to collapse and of course we can blame putin and everyone would say that but um, the threat has to be felt and we should not live next to volcano which can erupt any day and say that we do not notice uh, this volcano, that we are not looking at this volcano. We are voting for those who are saying that volcano is the best place uh, to fry our eggs. Uh, okay, the eggs are on the table. Of course. We can uh, remember what was happening before, uh, but let's talk about the future. The future is obligation. Yes. Well, uh, concluding... Um, this discussion, it's, uh, it will be logical to answer the question, well, the war will end and uh, what kind of scenarios are realistic? I uh, see that uh, no one can consider all the factors to understand uh, what will be the future. But uh, what is uh, a really big concern for me is how can we avoid not the volcano, but uh, the consequences of this volcano, the things which are... Um, and w in this case, we're ca talking about uh, Russian terrorism and also potential nuclear terrorism on the Pagiska NPP, and a uh, lack of response from Europe uh, and uh, the West, uh, the infrastructure... Um, the infrastructure attacks are uh, becoming less uh, uh, less obvious, and we have forgotten about uh, Kachovska uh, Dam. And by the way, recently we've seen uh, the pictures of how it was uh, being made by the Russians. And now, I think that we have the parallel reality, and we were talking about it today. And many people in the world, and also politicians uh, in the world, and mainly that are politicians, not the people who support um, Ukraine and the surveys show that in the US, in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, and also in Japan, and also in all European, in almost 
all European countries, um, except for maybe a few countries, they have uh, lower dynamics. But nevertheless, uh, most of the NATO and uh, EU countries support providing uh, the weapon to Ukraine. And it seems like people are supporting uh, this, but nevertheless, the politicians uh, are behind uh, the people. They are not ahead of this column. And uh, it's, it can lead to new elites and new people in the government. And it will be, we will see uh, the, the power factor, the strong uh, power a politician will be dominating. And I think that is going to be the trend not only in Ukraine, but also in Europe and in the US. And concluding this discussion, I think that Today we are we are in the and the wave uh, of uh, the wave uh, the way is going down, but it seems to me that the situation can change very fast uh, in half a year, and the situation can change absolutely. And the basic mistake is to make the conclusions regarding scenarios and the situation development. Um, considering uh, the nowadays evaluation and the situation. Therefore, I think that we have to not only just wait uh, for half a year, we have to change the situations ourselves. Uh, and I'm quite sure that these swings, uh, geopolitical swings, they will move from in the way uh, in the beneficial way for Ukrainians and all the factors which are needed for that uh, are already known uh, the leadership of our partners and also the package of support of the US and also the fast provision in this year um, F-16 and additional missiles because uh, we were discussing that um, uh, there is no other option um, but to so, there is no other option for this year. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that considering uh, what we were discussing today, I hope that uh, it will, I hope that the experts and politicians will not uh, use uh, these uh, parallels of Vietnamese, Korean parallels to describe the situation which is unfolding nowadays. They will suggest some innovative and uh, better conceptions. So thank you very much for this dialogue and uh, I hope that our and uh, that everyone liked this discussion as well. See you soon.